So here's what you expect in quiz one. You may see problems using Bernoulli's principle, right? You need to know when to use Bernoulli's principle. You need incompressible flow and the steady state flow. You also want to be able to know uh, where the flow field has zero vorticity. So uh, you should be able to be able to compute vorticity in the flow field. And uh, uh, also you have to compute the velocity field and uh, uh, so far we have been looking at free stream plus the flow induced by a number of straight vortex segments, right? So you need to be able to compute flow field uh, from that. And finally, uh, you want to be able to integrate the pressure field computed from uh, Bernoulli's principle and use plug that in into the conservation of momentum. The second type of uh, problems you may see is uh, flow around airplanes and the lifting line theory. The relation between bump vortices in the wing and the trailing vortices that come out of the wing. And uh, uh, you want to be able to calculate the downwash from the bound and trailing vortices, particularly how the downwash changes the magnitude of the lift and uh, also tilt the direction of the lift, creating induced drag. Kuda Joukowsky theorem relates the lift per unit uh, span with the circulation of the bound vortices. Uh, you need to know how to use them. And finally, evaluating lift coefficient and the induced drag coefficient and the control volume analysis using conservation of momentum. So finally, the flow over airfoils and thin airfoil theory is something we'll discuss in this lecture today. There is a few quiz practice problems I posted on Canvas uh, you can look at, and this corresponds to the three types of uh, problems you would expect in quiz one. So there is one using Bernoulli's. There is one uh, that corresponds to the flow around the airplanes and the lifting line theory. And uh, there is a third one relating the flow around airfoils. In the last lecture, we discussed the vortex panel method. In vortex panel method, we put a bunch of vortices around the contour of the airfoil. And we solved for the unknowns being the strength of the vortices we put around the airfoil. The equations we are solving is that the flow on the airfoil should be tangent to the geometry of the airfoil there cannot be any flow in the direction normal to the surface. These equations plus the cut condition gives us a set of equations that are not linearly dependent, so we can solve for the strength of the vortices, and as a result, we can compute the flow field around the airfoil. And from the flow field, from the velocities, we can use Bernoulli's to compute the pressure distribution. And from the pressure distribution, we can compute lift, moment, etc. And today we're going to be uh, going from this method to thin airfoil theory, which follows exactly the same principle. But instead of solving for the vorticity distribution numerically, it makes some further simplifying assumptions so that we're able to compute the vorticity distribution analytically. This simplifying assumption is that the airfoil is very thin, so that the vortex on the upper surface and lower surface is almost at exactly the same point. So that allows us to collapse the vortex on the upper and lower surface into a single vortex, whose strength is equal to the strength of the upper vortex plus the strength of the lower vortex. And the, the geometry of the airfoil, as a result, also collapses into a single camber line. And the, the vortices, which is equal to the vorticity on the upper plus the vorticity on the lower surface, right, resides on the camber line. The equations we are solving to compute the distribution of vorticity is very analogous to what we have in the vortex panel method. That is the tangency condition plus a color condition. The tangency condition 
tells us that the induced flow from all the vortices plus the free stream has to produce a flow in the direction that's tangential to the Campbell law. Yeah. Uh, and if you write down the induced flow by the collection vortices, right, the induced flow can be computed as an integral, right? Uh, so gamma uh, is the strength of the vortex and divided by x prime minus x gives us the induced flow at the x prime location on the Campbell law. We integrate that and add with the free stream. So that gives us the induced flow in the z direction. Now the equation we enforce is that the induced flow in the z direction divided by the flow in the x direction. Right here, we are assuming that uh, the x direction velocity is much, much larger than the induced flow uh, directions. So this is uh, this assumption comes from the assumption that the airfoil is very thin and uh, the angle of attack is very small. Now to solve this set of equations, we denote S as the slope of the airfoil at any x location. Right, so that uh, if we know the shape of the airfoil, we know the function SF, uh, S of x. And we plug that into the uh, tangency condition what we get is that uh, Sx is equal to uh, the integral of the contribution from the vorticities. And to solve these equations, we uh, do a particular change of variables that makes the solution analytically possible. That is, uh, uh, we represent x prime as half of c times 1 minus cosine of theta prime and uh, the same thing for x uh, we change x into a variable theta so this transforms the physical coordinate that x goes from 0 to c into an angular coordinate that uh, uh, theta goes from 0 to pi so here you can open uh, a desmos uh, you should have access to that uh, from the notebook i have and this illustrates what that change of variable is. So the x-axis goes from 0 to 1. So that's the physical coordinate going from the leading edge to the trailing edge. And the y-axis is the angle that goes from 0 to pi. Oh, and in the equation, uh, I should also add the, with the free stream contribution. So yeah, the velocity uh, should also have a free stream component on it. And we can move this free stream component uh, into the left-hand side so that uh, the right-hand side represents the unknown, the left-hand side are known quantities. So here we can see that uh, the unknown gamma is actually a linear function of s and uh, u infinity alpha. So that the resulting solution can be written as a summation of two parts. The first part uh, is the part corresponding to u infinity alpha. So that's uh, when s is equal to zero. And the second part is when the angle of attack is zero and we should get another solution that corresponds only to the shape of the airfoil. The final solution with both non-zero alpha and uh, uh, non-zero shape, non-zero slope, it's just a linear combination of the two solutions. So first, when s is equal to zero, uh, I'm not going to go through the derivation of the analytical solution, but you can solve gamma of x uh, to be a function that's one plus cosine theta divided by sine theta. So here you can see what that function looks like. Here I'm changing the slope of the airfoil so that it is at a non-zero uh, positive angle of attack with respect to the free stream, which is in the x direction. And you see the vorticity distribution, that's our gamma. So this is the function that is uh, uh, 1 plus cosine divided by sine of theta, where theta is that change of variable from the physical coordinate. And the one particular note here is that uh, the constant 1 actually 
doesn't really affect gamma being a correct solution of this mathematical integral equation. So if you change 1 into some other constant or even get rid of it, the gamma would still satisfy the equation. But the problem is that if you change that constant to something not equal to 1, the vorticity distribution would be infinity at the trailing edge. right? So if you put 0 0.7, 0 0.9, uh, the gamma is still going to be infinity at the trailing edge. If you put something greater than 1, it is positive infinity. Only when that constant is equal to 1, you get a non-infinite vorticity at the trailing edge. So that is basically enforcing the cutter condition, right? So the constant 1 here really represent uh, enforcing the cutter condition. Now let's go to the solution of gamma corresponding to a non-zero slope. So that corresponds to a cambered airfoil. So in order to get an analytical solution, we have to represent the slope into a, uh, a series, into a Fourier series, in this case a cosine series. So there is a constant term plus a series of cosines and each uh, term multiplied by, by a uh, magnitude. So by changing the magnitude of different A's, we can get basically any shape airfoil we want. And this is coded up in the decimals. So basically by changing the slide, uh, by changing the numbers A0, A1, etc., we can get uh, Campbell airfoils. So as you can see, changing A1 is going to get us a almost a parabola shape for the uh, Campbell line. The analytical solution for the gamma is the following. So the A0 term is basically a, a negative constant slope of the camber, and that is equivalent to a positive angle of attack. Right? So rotating the airfoil. Uh, so that the trailing edge goes down is the same as rotating the free stream uh, pointing a little bit up. So the solution corresponds to the A0 term is actually exactly the same as the solution corresponding to the non-zero angle of attack with a uh, zero camber airfoil. And then the terms corresponding to the uh, non-constant cambers is a sine series on the distribution of vorticity. So here you can see that uh, uh, having a non-zero A1 uh, makes the vorticity distribution behaves also like a, a semicircle. And, but changing A2 is going to make the camber uh, almost like a reflex shape. It's like an S shape. And uh, the resulting vorticity distribution also follows a, uh, a, a S curve. So this set of equations can get you from the geometry of the Campbell line to the vorticity distribution, right? Once you know the geometry, you can figure out what is A0, what is A1, etc. Right? By, uh, for example, in, in the decimals, uh, you can just uh, slide uh, the A1, A2 slices to find out the set of coefficients that best matches your uh, Campbell line shape, and then you should be able to see what is the vorticity distribution. But how do we go from vorticity distribution to the pressure distribution on the airfoil and ultimately lift and drag at moments? So here, we first relate the vorticity distribution to the velocity distribution around the airfoil, right? So basically, we compute the velocity induced by the vortices and then use Bernoulli's to go from the velocity induced by the vortices to the pressure distribution. So first of all, the velocity. To find out the velocity, and particularly the vorticity distribution, allows us to find out the velocity difference between the upper surface and the lower surface of the airfoil. To do this, let's draw a contour around a small segment of the airfoil that encloses a bunch of uh, vortices. 
the contour integral of velocity around that contour has to be equal to the uh, surface integral of the vorticity, right? Which is gamma times dx. And that contour integral, if we draw the contour so that the vertical segments are much smaller than the horizontal segments, right? So that the uh, velocity we're looking at is immediately on the upper and lower side of the uh, camber, then that integral can be represented as two parts, an integral on the upper side and an integral on the lower side. On the upper side, the direction of the integral is aligned with the velocity direction, so it's just the integral of velocity times dx. On the lower side, the direction of the integral is opposite to the velocity, so we subtract the integral on the lower side. And if the segment on the x direction is small, then we can uh, the integrals are basically u upper times dx minus u lower times dx, and that is equal to on the left hand side gamma dx. So that means the gamma is equal to the difference between the upper and lower velocities. And now we know uh, the, how the vorticity relates to the difference between velocities. How does that relate to pressure? Now we can use Bernoulli's. And also, if the uh, vorticity has small strength, which comes from uh, the assumption that uh, the small angle of attack and small slope of the camber line, then the difference between the upper pressure and uh, uh, p infinity, the free stream pressure, can be written using Bernoulli's, right? And if u upper is only slightly different from u infinity, we can write the u upper squared as this, and uh, uh, by expanding the squares. Right, delta u upper is the difference between u upper and u infinity. We can get a cancellation of the square term, and we can neglect the delta u upper square term, and uh, uh, the result is minus rho u infinity times delta u upper. We can do the same for the lower pressure, and uh, taking the difference between these two equations, what we get is that the difference between pressure on the upper and lower side is directly proportional to uh, gamma x. Oh yeah, uh, here I'm missing uh, u infinity uh, in front of the equation here. So now we know that the vorticity distribution directly is proportional to, to the difference between the uh, upper and the lower side pressure, right? That has a significant consequence on the lift and the moment. For example, the lift is just the integral of the pressure difference on the upper and lower sides, right? And so as a result of that, the lift coefficient, we can figure out uh, by dividing uh, the pressure difference by half of rho u infinity squared is exactly equal to 2 times the integral of the vorticity distribution. So here we can see that, uh, uh, for example, by tuning A0, the angle of attack term, we can get the lift coefficient. And uh, here we see that uh, when A0 is 0 0.05, the lift coefficient is 0 0.314. So that's exactly 2 pi times the angle of attack. Another consequence is the moment coefficient. Uh, traditionally, the moment coefficient is calculated around the quarter chord, so one-fourth uh, times the chord length. And also, the moment coefficient is uh, a positive when there is a nose-up moment. So uh, the moment arm is going to be positive when x is small at the leading edge. So it's a, a one-fourth minus x times the uh, pressure difference, which gets the moment coefficient to be two times an integral of a quarter minus x times the, uh, the vorticity distribution times dx. And here we see that for an uncambered airfoil, the moment coefficient is exactly zero, right? This is actually the reason why we define the quarter chord to be the location where the moment coefficient is uh, calculated. 
Now when we change the camber, change A1 for example, we see that the moment coefficient is no longer zero, right? 